Hi, everyone. Welcome. Oh, my goodness. This is a wonderful crowd. We had a feeling, we on the program committee, that this just might attract a nice group, and we're thrilled. Old members, new members, guests, all of you, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I hope you had a wonderful summer, even though it feels like that today. <laughs> it's not supposed to be this hot. OK, let me introduce Dr. Levine. Dr. Mark Levine is the current Vermont Commissioner of what? Health. Right, I knew you'd know that. Um, having served in this position since his appointment in 2017. Prior to his appointment, he was a professor of medicine at the University of Vermont, and most recently, the associate dean for graduate medical education. He also served as vice chair for education in the Department of Medicine and practiced general internal medicine. Dr. Levine received his BA in biology from the University of Connecticut and his MD from the University of Rochester. He completed his internal medical medicine residency and a chief resident year at the University of Vermont. He also completed a fellowship in general internal medicine at the University of North Carolina with emphasis on clinical epidemi I knew this was going to happen. Epi say it. Thank you. Epidemiology. <laughs> I, I practice too. Research, training, teaching, and administration of educational programs. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Mark Levine. Well, great to see such a great crowd. Uh, this is working? Yeah. Too loud, too soft, too whatever? Perfect. Okay. So. <clears throat> I don't know what you came here to hear today, uh, and we'll have time in the Q&A for things you don't hear, but I was asked to talk about a few things that I will talk about. I will also talk about a few things I wasn't asked to talk about, and I will say a little about COVID, but it's not a COVID talk. So if you need to leave now. <laughs> so we're going to do a little bit of, we have a little landscaping going on, so bear with it. We have uh, a little bit of public health 101, um, talking about health and public health and the state of health in Vermont. We're going to talk about how we make decisions in public health and um, what the fallout has been from the pandemic. I was specifically asked to address that we prepared for the next public health emergency and to update the opioid epidemic. Uh, and I was not asked, but because it is so important, and here we are sitting here on September 8th, uh, with the fan going because there's no air conditioning, but it's over 80 and we just came through a heat wave, we're going to talk about climate change as well because that is a public health issue. Everybody okay? Okay. So, I always feel I have to start a talk like this by letting people know that health and public health are not health care. Everybody thinks health care is where the action is, and believe me, I've spent a career in health care, and we do a lot of good things. But actually, health is very different. This is a WHO, uh, almost 75-year-old definition of health, which still stands true today, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. So something we should all be trying to achieve all of the time. Public health is really a definition that has evolved over time. Now, it still retains the elements of the core past definition, which is manage epidemics like we just did, protect us from even more of the myriad of environmental health threats that are out there, and thirdly, prevent chronic disease, which, by the way, is 80 plus cents on every healthcare dollar. <clears throat> the contemporary definition really understands that 
public health can't do everything. It's really an all of government, all of society exercise. So what can we do to collectively assure the conditions in which everyone can be healthy? And for us, it's all about forming collaborations and intersectoral partnerships built on adherence to science, data, and objectivity. So public health becomes sort of the catalyst. We have, we have the data. We have all the data. And um, the fact of the matter is we use that data to try to leverage important change that needs to occur uh, and enlist all of our partners in accomplishing that. So we are often the uh, public lens and the catalyst for change. So if I ask you what makes you healthy or not, majority of you would probably say the health care I get. But as you'll see in this pie chart, that's only 10% of what determines health. Now there's a genetic component, and we can debate the percent uh, that we kind of can't intervene with too much yet, though someday we probably will be doing more so. But then there's behavioral patterns. So what are your lifestyle choices, nutritionally, activity-wise, substance use, tobacco, et cetera? They determine a huge percentage of your health. And then the socioeconomic and environmental parts of the uh, uh, picture also determine a tremendous amount. So that is where public health gets really involved. And to further illustrate, in my three plus decades of being a doctor and having a practice, et cetera, et cetera, I worked from here up. So counseling and education, big deal. And does it work? Absolutely. But it might take 20 years for me to get a person who smokes to stop smoking. It might take 20 years for me to get somebody to adapt more healthy nutritional habits, et cetera, et cetera. Clinical interventions, that's basically managing things like I managed every day, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, chronic lung disease, you name it. And then long-lasting protective interventions, which are like, did you get your shots? Did you get your colonoscopy, mammography, et cetera? All critical, but as you'll notice on the left, they have the smallest impact on health. This is called the health impact pyramid for a reason. So the world I live in now and that I depended on but wasn't as actively involved in as a practitioner are these two bottom things. Changing the context, which means making one person's default decision the healthy one. So if you go buy a box of Nabisco crackers now, you can't find a gram of trans fat because we've proven trans fat is the worst fat for your heart and nobody's marketing any products that have it in it anymore. They've replaced it with healthier fats. If you live in a community that's decided to fluoridate the water, your teeth are pretty much protected uh, and you don't have a big decision to make unless you're so against fluoride that you're going to only buy bottled water. If you go to a restaurant, you don't have to worry that you're going to get lung cancer because everybody's smoking because we told society you can't do that anymore. So those are examples of things that change the context and really make a huge difference on a population level. And then the most impact is actually socioeconomic factors. Do you have access to wealth, employment, housing, food, you name it, all of the usual needs, which is what we're going to talk about next. So, Principles of population are to focus on the population, obviously, and prevention and wellness. And importantly, we focus in public health on do you have risk factors that we can modify and improve upon so they won't be as risky to you? And are there protective factors that we can actually uh, enhance and make a positive outcome more likely for you because of those protective factors. And it all ties into linking to what we call the social determinants of health, which is really the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, live, work, learn, age, and eventually die, um, and the systems that are put in place to deal with illness. 
So when we talk about these social determinants, it's pretty easy to understand them. On the left side, are you employed? Can you earn a good living? Do you have access to wealth? Or are you going to live in poverty? Moving along, do you have a secure place to live? Because housing is health care. Housing is everything, as we've discovered in Vermont uh, all too harshly. Do you have transportation to get from a place to a place? And that might mean get to a park where you can exercise. That might mean get to a job. Do you have the same access to education as we would expect everybody in society should? And then do you have food security? And how do we sort of put that into action? Well, very common disease, asthma. So asthma is something that uh, is prevalent in society. It's a little higher in Vermont than most other states, to be honest. Um, and it turns out the management of your asthma isn't just did you get an inhaler from your doctor, and do you know how to use it correctly? Uh, and did you quit smoking, et cetera, et cetera? It actually has to do with these social determinants. So if you study people by education status and try to link that to the prevalence of asthma, you find that there's a statistically significant relationship between having less than a high school education and having way more asthma than everybody else. Same thing if you look at their uh, linkage to the federal poverty level. The, the worse poverty you have, the more likely asthma is really out of control. So how do we use that information? Well, turns out that introduces the concept of health equity. Health equity means everyone has the same opportunity. That's the care work. A fair and just opportunity to enjoy good health. And if you don't have that fair and just opportunity, it's usually because of historical disadvantages or injustices and all kinds of inequalities that add up into the words we don't like to say every day, like racism, discrimination, bias, you name it. Uh, that's where we lose equity. This picture tries to show on the left equality. Everybody has the same support to stand on to try to see the game. But that's not equity. In the middle, there's actually different levels of support to accommodate the different individuals. That's equity. The right side, you've removed the barrier totally. Some people call that liberation. Um, but that's sort of helping you just if you're a good visual learner, understand equity. And we, we apply an equity lens to these kinds of problems. So if we think about respiratory diseases like asthma and things of that sort, uh, we have a lot of questions we can answer. We reframe from focusing on the populations with health conditions to the systemic uh, conditions that cause these conditions. So let's again look at asthma through a health equity lens. The orange line is sort of the rates of uh, emergency department visits for people with asthma. We're using kids and adolescents in this example. Low poverty, medium poverty, high poverty. The darkest on the left is cockroaches. Turns out people who are living in the worst uh, levels of poverty have the worst levels of emergency department visits for asthma. Same thing applies to rats, or dust mites, all kinds of vermin. If you move on to the lighter blue, to things like mold and secondhand smoke, the same relationship holds. So obviously, that leads to a whole set of questions like, what are the maintenance requirements for rented properties? How do they maintain either harmful living conditions or improved living conditions? Are there resources for mold treatment and uh, removal, et cetera, et cetera? But this, again, illustrates housing is health care. It doesn't matter how well managed these kids are by their pediatrician or pulmonary specialist. Where they live is determining why they're so sick. Um, 
a stark example. So we'll, we'll keep these concepts in mind as we go on through the rest of this talk. I was asked to address what is the state of health in Vermont. And broadly speaking, we are always one of the healthiest states. And we should all be proud of that. We're in the top five every year, depending on who's doing the analysis, whether it's the uh, United Health Consortium, whether it's um, the Commonwealth Fund. There's a whole bunch that do this analysis. But as I've just illustrated, it depends who you are. So the average Vermonter puts us into that group of top five states of being healthy. But when you start focusing in on people by race, by their gender and sexual orientation, by their disability status, or by their socioeconomic status, or even if they're more rural in a pretty rural state, you start to see all of the disparities in health. So unless you focus in in that way, you delude yourself into thinking we are a healthy state and everybody enjoys good health and has the same access and opportunity to good health. We do a state health assessment and a state health improvement plan every five years. And the last time around, these are the things we chose to focus on. The broad area of child development, the high cost and impact area of chronic disease, and then very obvious things, mental health and substance use disorder. This is even before the pandemic. And we added in oral health because there are such disparities in oral health for our children in this state. We knew we couldn't look only at that. We had to look at the social conditions as well that we've discussed already during the talk uh, in aggregate to really get a good picture. And our aspiration was, if we had worked over five years and weren't interrupted by the pandemic, uh, and were working towards uh, achieving health equity, we would have accomplished that people have a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. And it would have looked at the core values of equity, affordability, and access. And then everything on the right side of the slide are all those social determinants, whether it's your ability to exercise, have healthy food, have quality housing, you name it, have a great job, it's all in there. Because again, the recognition is public health is not just fix a disease, it's prevent a disease by providing the most opportunity to uh, everybody who lives here. And so when we talk about how do we reduce health inequities, the traditional, what we call downstream approach, is our healthcare system. It's managing disease and trying to counsel and educate people about risky behaviors and lifestyle choices. Not enough to accomplish this task. The now called midstream approach is address the social determinants in our physical and social and economic environments. The most enlightened and current upstream approach is work on these inequities. Acquisition of power and wealth, racism, discrimination on the grounds of disability status, gender, you name it. Um, obviously, public health can't do that work in a vacuum. They need every partner they can have, and it has to be a whole of government and a whole of society approach. So let's talk about a little bit, how do we actually do evidence-based public health practice? So. You know, during the pandemic, people saw this in action all the time. And discerning people began to come out on one side or another of policy decisions that get made. But really, public health practice that's evidence-based is trying to integrate science-based interventions with community preferences to improve the health of the population. Not everyone's going to agree on everything. We know that. We try to be data-driven. We try to use the engagement of communities. We have evaluation components. And we look at the acceptability of something. Because you can tell people, do this. Uh, something like, wear a mask. Who would have thought that might not be acceptable in some way for preventing a respiratory disease from being spread? Other things you might ask people to do, they might go, well, I'm not going that far. Um, so you have to understand, just like if I tell you, 
you need to have a colonoscopy starting at age 45, and you laugh at me and go, there's no way in hell I'm doing that. Well, that was an unrealistic thing for me to counsel you about, but the reality is I could prove to you that that would actually be a life-saving, potentially life-saving uh, intervention for you to have. And political considerations, and I don't consider my job political, but lots of people do consider it that way, um, but you can't ignore them. So we talked about fluoridating water. Well, how many communities have had major you know, upheavals and controversies and have not chosen to fluoridate their water because they believe there are adverse impacts of that that outweigh the public health benefit? We have an opioid use crisis. Uh, and we do things like tell people to go to needle exchanges and get clean needles so you don't transmit hepatitis or HIV. Well. There's a little bit of stigma that goes in that makes some people say, you've got to be kidding me. And now we're talking about overdose prevention centers. And there's a lot of stigma that goes into people saying, you've got to be kidding me. Yet on the other hand, if you can prove that these are harm reduction strategies that save lives, and people might eventually get to treatment and have a successful productive life, um, you've got to balance it with that. And then we try to get people to stop smoking it's one thing to sort of, you know, tell kids in school it's bad for you, tell adults here, take, take some gum or take a patch and see what happens. But there's also like we can tax the hell out of it and make it so expensive that people will stop buying it. And we could do that with vaping, which we just did a few years ago. So every public health decision, even if it sounds really important and good for us all, is going to be met with some element of political controversy. This is just the toolkit for what we used in COVID. Lest people think we were such geniuses, I mean, there's only so many things you can do to prevent a respiratory virus. So of course, stay home when sick is like number one on the list. Uh, but it's also, you know, social distancing and coughing into your shoulder and uh, washing your hands all the time, et cetera. But then there's things like masking indoors with a high quality mask. But do you just recommend that? Do you mandate that? Get testing. See if you have a close contact, that person should be quarantined. That's a huge thing for disrupting somebody's life. Don't go to a large gathering because you're more likely to get it there than you are if you stay away from large gatherings. Get vaccinated. Get revaccinated. Get boosted. Uh, Stay up to date. Require a, a vaccine passport to get into somewhere. And then stay home, stay safe, which is, of course, the lockdown kind of thing. So all those kinds of things, people think, you know, well, they don't think we were cavalier about any of it, but the reality is we didn't have a pandemic. We had five pandemics. Because if you really look at the different parts of the pandemic, different decisions were made from the beginning of when we had nothing to fight the virus to when we got to Delta to when we got to Omicron, et cetera. Uh, it was a different virus. It was a different population and their level of immunity. There were different tools at different times. So every decision had to be uh, reanalyzed because we were in a different place. And not only were we in a different place, but when it came to the decision making, we had a lot of work to do. Um, not only did we know that someone getting sick has a big disruption to their life and the lives of those around them, but they also have a significant risk of getting long COVID. Fortunately, that risk has decreased over time, but it's still present. And we know that there are some groups of us that are more vulnerable. And I see a number of masks here, and I see the age of the people here, and it's like people understand that they're more vulnerable. And some of you may actually have illnesses too that make you feel more vulnerable. So we have to balance everyone who feels they're vulnerable with can society function if we enforce certain rules on everybody in society. And that changed with time during the pandemic too. And then we learned collectively as a society and as public health across the country about health equity. Because the statistics for the BIPOC population were absolutely much worse than for the general population. And then in Vermont, 
we found we had outbreaks related to multi-generational housing, which not everybody has, but certainly our refugee populations, uh, that was a frequent occurrence. The very youngest and the uh, very oldest all in the same household. We had migrant workers in our apple orchards and elsewhere. We had cultural groups that were networking through what we call sociocultural networks, which increased their risk based on the activities they did in common. And then even in our correctional facilities, we had no deaths in corrections. We had plenty of outbreaks, but we had plenty of policies to protect those in the correctional facilities. We also had a subset of our incarcerated in Mississippi, and Mississippi had essentially no policies uh, and had much huger outbreaks than we had here, uh, and it was really challenging to try to manage one population that's in two states and one state we had little control over. People wondered about, well, why didn't we mandate a mask when Delta came versus we mandated it earlier? And I've alluded to the fact that there were different aspects of the pandemic that you had to look at all the data at each time. But think about what we were facing as we were getting into that phase of the pandemic. We had multiple issues in our society. There was mental health for sure, suicide as part of that, increase in substance use, the isolation, Social isolation is really the, the thing in public health that leads to all the bad outcomes. Well, that was certainly part of the pandemic. We had the impact on our kids, whether you measure that by academics or by their social or emotional development. And then this concept of health debt, which essentially refers to the fact that we might have had good lifestyle choices in terms of physical activity and nutrition and avoiding bad things prior to the pandemic. But then a lot of those habits got worse during the stress of the pandemic and made chronic disease higher in prevalence, exacerbated people's underlying chronic disease, and leads to long-term negative health impacts, which means the chronic diseases we were already having trouble with are getting worse. And when you read in the summertime and all this year about our emergency rooms being full, and hospitals actually being challenged in terms of having enough beds. It's not because of COVID patients being admitted, it's because of chronic disease. And then of course there's navigating trade-offs. Every governor wants their state's economic status to be as healthy as it was without a pandemic during a pandemic. Really challenging for that to happen, needless to say. However, if you compare us to a state like South Dakota, for instance, similar size, Republican governor, rural state, we have the same economic um, outcomes that they had in terms of getting back to the GDP we were before the pandemic and our workforce uh, employment and all of that. Yet, we had like the best experience in terms of lowest deaths in the country uh, and cases and hospitalizations and South Dakota was on the other end of the spectrum because their governor said, I only care about the economy. Um, school closures, of course, were a litmus test for everybody's patience and perseverance uh, and evolved during the course of the pandemic. Do you recommend something? Do you mandate something? Do you have what I call a nanny state versus a savvy state? So a nanny state would mean sugar, sugary beverages are bad for you and are gonna give you obesity and diabetes. So we're going to tax the heck out of them and we're going to make them hard to be accessible versus a savvy state that's sort of like, well, we're going to try to do all that but uh, educate you more and not really impinge, impinge upon your lifestyle choices as much. These are really challenging decisions, as you might imagine, that public health officials, governors, legislatures all go through. The key to success, by the way, if you didn't know it already, is frequent communication and transparency. So, we're gonna focus a little bit on environmental health now at this phase, because it's all around us. You know, we've activated what we call our health operations center. That's like our emergency response arm in public health. Uh, four times in the last couple years. First COVID, then MPOX, then that winter storm that was such a high wind thing and a disastrous thing with power outages and all of that, that was a very short activation. And then 
the flood, of course, uh, and everything that we're seeing to this day. So we have an environmental health component in addition to an emergency preparedness component uh, that traditionally looks at things like lead. And you may recall we passed some laws about lead in school drinking water uh, to protect our kids' brains. Cyanobacteria, which is the blue-green algae, food and water safety, and climate and health. We only have like a, a one and a quarter FTE doing that work because we rely on CDC for a lot of money and there is no money for that uh, yet. But if you ask the World Health Organization, they say what's in the title, that climate change is the greatest public health threat in the 21st century. If you ask all the major health organizations, they call it a public health emergency. And if you um, read an editorial from journal editors in 2021 of all the major medical journals, they basically say if our global temperature goes to that degree, which it already has, it's the greatest threat to global public health. So um, we have uh, analyzed our situation in Vermont, and we think these are the six key health impacts. First of all, heat-related illness. We're talking heat exhaustion, heat stroke, things that you try to prevent every day with air conditioning. And uh, sometimes they're challenging to prevent because we have three days of 90 plus degrees in September. That's a heat wave. Uh, and if that keeps going on, that's not good. Storms and floods like we just went through. Our biggest emphasis was on molds, on uh, debris, and uh, hazards in the waterways that people wanted to recreate on, and water quality issues because of the tremendous influx of bacteria as well as chemicals. Vector-borne diseases, we all know Vermont has a lot of ticks and has Lyme disease, but there are many other vector-borne diseases that ticks provide called babesiosis, anaplasmosis, and now mosquitoes. Um, West Nile virus, and there's going to be a press release in minutes, you're getting to know it first, talking about a horse who just died of eastern equine encephalitis, triple E. Um, no human has had that this year. No human has had that in Vermont in 10 years. But we found mosquitoes in it this year that, that have it in their uh, testing for the first time since 2015. So we're putting out a little special alert now because um, humans who live in the areas of concern, which are in Grand Isle and Franklin counties, uh, need to be cautious and probably not going to football practice in the evening when the mosquitoes are out biting. Um, cyanobacteria blooms, the more erosion and uh, flooding you have, the more phosphorus goes into the waterways. The cyanobacteria love that. Um, and beaches were closed during these heat waves here in Burlington. Water and foodborne diseases go without saying. And then air quality impacts. By that, we're talking about wildfires uh, from Canada, which are not rare anymore. Uh, respiratory allergens like pollens that are increased in frequency with the longer seasons because of the climate change that's occurred. We now have an air quality index that you can go on our website and find out if what the air quality is that day and what zone it's in, in terms of what behavior you should do or not do. And then we have the confounding confluence of things, where we have people in Montpelier finally able to go outside and cart out all the furniture that they have to throw away, uh, all the drywall that they have to throw away, and we want them to be outside and away from the mold, but it's a day that the air quality is in the red zone. And it's like you shouldn't be doing exertional work outside that day. This is, this is what has happened now. Not to make you lose hope or anything, but, uh, <laughs> but this is what we're facing. Uh, and back to health equity, if you're in a marginalized population, it impacts you more. So who lost their housing? It wasn't most of Montpelier. Uh, that they lost a lot of businesses, and that's very tragic. But the people who were living along the rivers and lost their housing and their mobile homes were actually people in the lowest socioeconomic class in the state. Um, and so 
it's almost a form of rural redlining, if you will, where in cities, you know, there are neighborhoods that nobody would want to live in, but people are living in, and it's been orchestrated by society why they're living in those neighborhoods, and they have the worst air to breathe, they have the asphalt jungles, no greenery, et cetera. And here we are in a rural area like Vermont, and if you're more socioeconomically challenged, you ended up having a bigger hit from these natural disasters. Um, and of course, we can exacerbate that further if our solution is to drive electric cars and give subsidies to those who buy them. Well, that helps the wealthy, but it doesn't help the people on the lower end of the economic ladder. Multiple other impacts in terms of mental health, in terms of, uh, especially in our farmer population, and their crops have been really ruined. Thank God agriculture has come in with some economic relief for them. Exercise, uh, we're telling people to be healthy and exercise, but if it's riskier for you to be outside because it's too hot or because you like to hike but don't hike because there's too many ticks or whatever, how do we give those messages and, and achieve an equilibrium there? Chronic illnesses, all physicians know, do much worse in heat. And then soil and crop damage leads to nutritional issues. So what else does public health do? Uh, you may not have known we do this in public health. Um, so we have a very active, and I'm, I'm being selective here. We have a very active maternal and child health section. We now call it family and child health uh, to try to be more um, equi equity minded, if you will. But the fact of the matter is they do things throughout pregnancy, throughout early childhood years, through adolescence, uh, focusing on getting people to uh, breastfeed, school health issues, adolescent health issues, prevention of substance use and other things like that. And we have a WIC program, Women, Infants and Children, to really help the nutritional status of those who are below a certain level of the federal poverty level. <laughs> I like to think of the work I've done with my department in that capacity as preserving kids' brains. So I talked about lead in school drinking water. Uh, the biggest source of lead, of course, is in houses that were painted before the 1980s where uh, lead-based paint was used. And that we still have problems in that area, but we've really taken care of a lot. But now we found lead in the drinking water in schools and fortunately an easy way to mitigate that. But that was a success story. We have a trio of laws to combat va vaping that were passed a few years ago. One was to increase the age of using any products to 21. The second was to put the same excise taxes on these products as on combustible traditional cigarettes. And the third was really internet protections because kids could go on and say what they, they were whatever age they wanted to say and buy these products, which is not the intent. Um, we focus a lot on building resilience across state government, preventing what's called toxic stress, which leads to what are termed adverse childhood experiences that really set a kid up very poorly for a successful life. We have a substance misuse prevention council, emphasis on the prevention, and then the whole issue of recovery from COVID has been focused essentially on kids and mental health and all of that stuff that we talked about earlier. So there's an actual section called Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, which is where my heart is, and I wish I could do more, because as an internal medicine physician, I, I want nothing more than to prevent all the chronic diseases so we don't have to manage them all the time anymore and keep society healthier. But the reality is they get the least federal, least federal money of anybody. Um, and it's not that people don't understand it, but there are so many other pressing things, I think, that it's hard to just sprinkle the money equitably everywhere. But our tobacco control program is housed there. Oral health, which we're making some progress in Vermont on, is housed there. Still have a lot of work to do with lower socioeconomic class individuals and preserving kids' teeth at those ages. We have self-management programs for diseases like asthma and diabetes. And now a whole new focus with our partners in the Department of Aging and Independent Living is healthy aging. Because the reality is we are one of the three oldest states, 
along with New Hampshire and Maine. And not only do we have to worry about that demographic, we also have to realize that anything you do to make aging healthy is helping everybody at every age. So it's helping the family that's just arriving in Vermont to grow up in a good, healthy place. It's helping the person who's going to take a new job and come to Vermont to live. Uh, the, the, uh, the rising tide uh, raises all boats, essentially, is the concept. I did mention earlier emergency preparedness and injury prevention. That is really what happens when there is a major disaster. That arm of our operation goes into play. Uh, we run the EMS around the state. We do all the disaster response. And then in prevention, we do things like falls prevention in older people. We do uh, suicide prevention no matter what your age. Uh, things that actually take a high toll in society. Um, injury prevention would also be considered to include opioid overdoses and things of that sort, but we have a whole other division to, to deal with those. But are we prepared for the next public health emergency? Well, to be prepared, these are the ingredients. You need a workforce. Well, number one, the healthcare workforce struggled during the uh, pandemic and lost a lot of its membership due to burnout. Same thing has happened in public health, but it's happened in multiple sectors of society. And if you listen to Governor Scott, every sector is challenged in Vermont with workforce. We don't have enough people moving into the state to, to help us with that. Data modernization. The CDC has admitted a true confession to the country that you know they're antiquated when it comes to the, what, what they operate on for data. And Congress gave them a lot of money. They've sprinkled that money to states. We're benefiting it from some of it, but there's a lot of work to do, and it doesn't happen overnight. Infrastructure is sort of involved in that as well. Laboratory capacity. Um, lots of public health emergencies require a public health lab, because not everybody does tests for things like anthrax and ricin and, and other biohazards, never mind the amount of testing that needs to be done early on with something like COVID before you have uh, healthcare system capacity. Congressional memory, I wish I could be optimistic there. Um, you know, lots of pandemic money came during COVID. Most of it runs out 2024 and 2025. And listening to the rhetoric, there won't be any more coming. But the whole thesis that we present is the country was not ready for pandemic when it when it hit us, and not only was the country not ready, the, um, the, the bottom line is we had a 50-state strategy. We didn't have like a, a national strategy uh, and leadership to help craft that. So I don't see, I, I see the leadership having evolved, which is great, but the congressional memory is like they got too many other fish to fry and they're not going to be giving us a lot more money, and we'll be in the same situation with workforce and infrastructure that we were in pre-COVID. And CDC funding is totally reliant on congressional appropriations, and state health departments like mine are really highly, not totally, but highly reliant on CDC sending us money. So I think, you know, we proved we were pretty prepared in Vermont, but it's not optimal. And we'll be as prepared for the next one, uh, but we're challenged by everything on this slide. And then some overarching themes. I'm just going to focus in on this one with, actually, I'm going to ignore this one because these are very COVID related. Uh, but I did want to talk about this. The word zoonosis means it's an infection that's usually in the animal, animal world and then goes to the human. Well, this is our future. We saw it with COVID, we saw it with MPOX, and um, we'll see it even more. Climate change is doing a lot of that. The mobility of populations, obviously, things travel through the world very quickly. We are encroaching on animal environments and on their ecozones. There are concentrations of humans in cities, and there are concentrations of animals in markets like Wuhan. Everything on this slide allows a zoonosis to sort of take hold and perhaps spread. Um, so 
it's the expectations in the infectious disease in public health world that this is going to happen more frequently. So it will not be 100 years before this happens. And then the last topic is going to be just to give you up-to-date information on opioids. We have a substance use programs division that deals with everything that's on this slide, and it's all critical stuff. Um, currently in 2023, 95 overdose deaths through May, three-year average 78. That tells you we're not going the right way yet. And to reinforce that, this is data through 2022. The blue line shows the rate. The others show the numbers. But obviously, a tragic occurrence going on with deaths from opioid overdose in our society. Keep in mind, I, I am still subscribing to the fact that it's not because we're not doing anything. It's because the drug supply is so toxic at this point in time, and people succumb very quickly. We have a whole bunch of things going on. Fortunately, we're starting to see millions of dollars come into the state for opioid settlements, and we have a whole committee that I'm in charge of that works to get uh, the, right, the right money to the right place, which I'll show you in a second. We pioneered decriminalization of buprenorphine, which is the major drug besides methadone used in medications for opioid use disorder. And decriminalizing had no adverse impacts. I wish it had more beneficial, but it didn't. Um, decriminalization of other substances and overdose prevention sites are hot topics now. And I won't give you opinions, but just say that they are under discussion. And they are having presentations to our committees. We have a mental health integration council because mental health is so poorly integrated into general health care. Our hub and spoke system, which is really nation leading for, uh, in the country uh, for treatment of opioid use disorder, is going to broaden more so that it manages all substances and so that it manages co-occurring mental health disorders. And then dovetailing into this is a public safety initiative with the governor's 10-point plan because there's been more violence in our communities, some of which is related to this epidemic, but not all. Um, and here's where our monies went in the last year. This is eight plus million dollars. We focused purely on harm reduction, more naloxone in all kinds of places. Uh, fentanyl and xylazine test strips, wound care because xylazine causes horrific wounds and that's a way to get people involved in your system. Stimulant use disorder, we have more than I can imagine people dying who thought they were using cocaine and methamphetamine, but it wasn't. It was powder that had uh, fentanyl mixed in with it and because they didn't have tolerance to fentanyl, they succumbed to an overdose. So there's an actual evidence-based incentivization program that's used to treat stimulant use disorder that we're going all out on. And then drug checking services where people without liability can get their powders checked and understand what it is they're injecting. And then enhancing access to the treatment system because so many of the overdose deaf people were not connected at all to treatment. So trying to increase our hubs and make them more geographically accessible outreach workers, whether they be on the streets, in homeless shelters, in hotels, finding people where, where they are, essentially. And then, hopefully, one of our principles, invest in youth prevention. Uh, we will return this year to also some monies going specifically to youth prevention amidst this need for great harm reduction. So that's sort of going to wrap up my uh, presentation. I've taken you on a whirlwind tour of uh, public health, and I thought I'd leave 15 minutes for questions. It turns out to be 11, but um, I'll, I can stay a few minutes after for those who don't get their fair shake. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, one quick announcement. Those of you who are expecting the Harborview bus, that's coming at 15 minutes after 3, so you don't have to rush out. Great. Do we have any um, questions on Zoom? Just one? Well, let's start with that. What about firearms and public health? Yeah. What about firearms and public health? So uh, that's a big one for me. Um, 
early, early during my time as commissioner, we had that uh, Fairhaven event, which got from VPR, it got jolted was the name of the thing, because the governor was jolted by what he saw, which was a plan for a, a former student to go back to the school and shoot up the school. Uh, so some important gun uh, laws went into effect then, which had to do with extreme risk protection orders, uh, mental health state, um, background checks, you know, some fundamental things that one never would have thought would have happened in Vermont. So public health was in the background. We weren't certainly leading, but we were providing the evidence basis and all of that, which I think was important. Um, but the other thing is, more recently, uh, as you know, suicide occurs most successfully with a firearm. So there was a law that was just passed that the governor did allow to go into law that was basically focused on a waiting period so people don't have the opportunity to make a rash, impulsive decision, uh, but can actually uh, ha they have to wait several days where perhaps they would have thought things through a little differently or access some other help. Um, there's also been an expansion of some of those background checks and the uh, safe storage aspect of firearms, which is probably the number one public health thing, kind of got into law this past uh, congressional se uh, legislative session. So a lot has gone on uh, that's good for public health and good for everybody uh, without necessarily, as it goes, taking away guns from people. Um, and interfering with their Second Amendment rights, but doing common sense public health interventions. So that's a big role for public health. The CDC now has a very small component of its operation devoted to that. Dr. Levine, I don't have a question, I have an observation. <laughs> I think I'd like to thank you and our Governor Phil Scott for the effective, efficient way orderly way we took it from higher age down in treating vaccinations for COVID. You people did a wonderful job. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. so, and, th and thank you for that. Uh, and I would just comment, again, communication and transparency were everything. We, we told the state, here's our data. Not everyone is dying from COVID, but there are people who are dying at a much higher rate than everybody else. And it was really a very nice relationship graphically to show that the older you were, the more risk you had. So why wouldn't it make sense to put you first in line and not a 20-year-old who works in a supermarket and feels that they're exposed, but they might die? Because that wasn't happening. Thank you. Mark, over here. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful presentation. It was very clear and uh, it gave us a lot to think about and to understand as well. My question is, is there research that supports getting vaccine vaccines, let's say, a month apart? So if we're talking about COVID's newest variant, uh, the flu and RSV, uh, what research is there that says that spacing might be more effective than having them collectively given? Yeah, glad you asked that question. I could just turf it and say, come to the press conference next Wednesday, because <laughs> we're going to talk about it. But the reality is, you'll get it first. Flu and COVID, the research is fine at this point. Getting them together does not reduce the effectiveness of one or the other, um, and really doesn't enhance your getting bad effects or anything of that sort. And if it does nothing else, it, it, it acts as a memory for you so that you're not going to forget one or the other because you got them at the same time. The RSV is a new vaccine just out this year. Just so people know, it's for over age 60. It's not one of these mRNA vaccines like the COVID one. It's a traditional protein-based vaccine. And if you're over 60, and especially if you're over 60 and have significant lung or heart disease, that vaccine is for you. It's being billed as recommended with shared decision making. Shared decision making is code word for talk to your doctor. Uh, but it's also code word for 
The committee wasn't ready to say 100%, just get it uh, and don't ask questions. Because there were, a, and I don't want to overblow this, a slight amount of neurologic adverse effects in a small number of people that were in the trials. So we call that a signal. It wasn't a statistically significant outcome. It's the kind of thing you want to watch closely post-marketing, once it's out there in the population, to see is that real or was that just uh, uh, an artifact of the study population. So that's the caution in it. But the other caution is we have no studies that show whether getting it with or without another vaccine makes it as effective as it is billed to be. And it's quite effective, by the way, in reducing RSV hospitalizations in older people with these diseases. So I tell people I wouldn't get it with another vaccine. But there's nothing out there that says you can't do that. But there's just no data. Um, I wondered, you mentioned in passing that um, the large settlement, opioid settlement, and um, I may be confused about this, so if you can help me. My understanding is that the case is going to the U.S. Supreme Court because Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers were able, in all of those negotiations, to say that this was really a bankruptcy. And so that put some limits on both the amount and the timing of, that, of the payoff. And so do you know, is it at the Supreme Court now, or are, is the state actually getting what they're supposed to get over that agreement? You're talking about the Sackler. I'm talking about, I'm talking about, but isn't that what the opioid money to the state is coming from We that have seven settlement? different funds. Oh, okay. So Sackler is the one that's still tied up in the courts, even though it was probably the first one. Uh, it's supposed to be, for us, $3 million a year for 18 years, so $54 million. But we do have a number of other manufacturers, as well as distributors, um, that we're getting money from right now. Uh, so um, over the 18-year period, we'll have in excess of $100 million. Sounds like a lot, but you've got to realize programs you institute today, if you need to keep them alive, they need to be subsidized each year, so it reduces the amount you have for something new the next year. But, but it's really good because it combines with our state money, which is $3 million a year for prevention for kids, and now federal money, which we've been getting for many years, that is more substantial. Mark, my question is tangentially related, which is that how does the availability of specialists in the hospitals and the inability to get timely appointments impact the state of public health? Yeah, good question. Um, so the question is, um, let, let me turn this down. The, the question is, we have a problem in our hospitals and in our healthcare system with access to specialty care and long wait times. How does that affect public health at large in the state? So, you know, the flip side of that is we actually have really good access to primary care. And even though you may need to wait for your appointment, uh, we are like one of the best states in the country, if not the best, for the number of people in our population that have a primary care clinician. Um, so that's good because primary care is capable of managing a real lot. But I do agree that there are things that have to be elevated to specialty care. Um, we did some, you know, when Secretary Smith was still here, we did some uh, studies with UVM of what is going on there, and I think the bottom line ended up being a problem with hiring people, often because Vermont didn't pay the kinds of salaries that other states pay, et cetera. Um, and so it was very hard to solve the wait time if you couldn't increase the number of people in the practice. Um, 
We don't have a good measure to say how that's impacting public health in general. Most of the measures in public health rely on access to health care. And that's a very broad category. So it doesn't isolate out access to primary care, access to specialty care. And so by that parameter, that's one of the reasons we rank so high all the times on these, on these health surveys is because we have access to health care. I'd like to think in an emergent situation, we also have access to everything that you would need in terms of specialty care. Uh, but I, I can't give you a firm answer about how it's impacting public health in general just because we don't really have that measure. Uh, I'm, my, my question is in the relationship uh, well, public health and mental health s systems. And um, I was pleased to see that the priorities of dental and mental went up on the list. If <laughs> an early visual showed them, I don't know, third and fourth, so I think was the case. Dental first, mental. But it has traditionally you know, gotten short shrift. Both have under insurance systems yeah. and other ways. And so I, I, it is my impression, uh, I wasn't living in the state over the last 40 years, but it, many states did devote more money, I believe, and attention to an organized mental health care system that worked well, and I have the impression that Vermont retrenched on that score, uh, certainly from specialized care. Um, and, but in any event, coming up to the present, I'm interested in your, your overall, um, I, I have a particular question, is the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Health well integrated? How, how well they work together? That's a broad probe kind of question. And yep. um, where do you see most of the action? I saw a number of signs that suicide is getting attention and violence to some extent and opioid. But m mental health, how, does, how do you see it in, in relation to that, as uh, particularly picking up on the specialized care part? Yep. Yeah. Good. So yeah. Mental Health Integration Council, which I mentioned, I co-chair that with the Deputy Commissioner from the Department of Mental Health. So we're very tightly aligned. We have our last meeting after a year and a half of meetings next week, actually. And we're going to come out by the end of the year with a whole set of recommendations about how better to integrate mental health into overall health care. There'll be things like the whole health model, which just by the sound of it sounds like we should all want it. Um, but, but it is a real evidence-based program. There are things like um, integrating or embedding mental health expertise in primary care settings, which is already happening in some parts of the UVM Medical Center and elsewhere. Uh, there's a whole host of things that actually can improve that integrative piece, not to mention the way we pay for things and the way we incentivize care because Healthcare reform has got to be a core piece of this. Just as you alluded, things don't always get paid for the way they should, and they certainly don't get incentivized the way they should, because there's a lot of services to be delivered. Not only traditional health care and physical health, but the mental health component, the substance use component, et cetera. So can't solve it all overnight, but we are very integrated at the state level in recognizing the problem and in calling it out. And it was one of the major reasons we took masking from a mandate to a strongly recommend later in the pandemic because we really needed to have people able to focus on these emerging problems that were so severe at the time and still continue. Uh, thank you. Um, I was very pleased to see your emphasis on oral health, but my understanding was you're talking about it primarily in terms of uh, oral health programs for children. Yep. Um, but it, it, it's my understanding that oral health has an impact on many other aspects of systemic health throughout the lifespan. Yes, and it does. And it in many ways becomes more acute in the elderly. Um, yep. Could you talk a little bit more about um, what you're actually doing for oral health in children yep. and whether there are plans to um, expand, expand that, extend this to, um, yep. uh, Good. You, know, you know, throughout the, throughout the lifespan. So the big part of that, starting with the adult, is especially with periodontal disease, disease in the gums and inflammation, uh, there's correlations with cardiac disease and other severe outcomes in adults. Um, Again, 
the adult who's a general average Vermont retiree uh, probably has access to all the care they're going to need on that part of the spectrum. But if you look at those in Medicaid, uh, we don't have enough dentists. Dentists can't survive economically in the state if they take 100% Medicaid. And that population uh, was only getting reimbursed at 50% of the rate. So the law went into effect in the last uh, session that raised that to 75%. And we have good news from the dental community that that was a positive thing for them. They would actually increase the amount of Medicaid that they saw, so helping the adults. But the real problem is pediatric dentistry and having enough people to see kids, especially kids who are socioeconomically low on the ladder or have other reasons in the health disparities list to uh, not get the care. There are so many novel interventions, varnishing of the teeth, a substance called silver diamine fluoride, which uh, not only identifies cavities but manages them, and just general preventive dentistry that many of these kids have no exposure to. So the goal is to find a, a touch point. The touch point may be a school nurse, maybe a pediatrics office. You don't think a pediatrician is doing dentistry, but it's very easy to paint the varnish on kids' teeth. Uh, the touch point may be somebody coming to the school as a dental hygienist who uh, works for the health department. Um, we have numerous places to try to put that. But that system needs vast expansion and more financial support. But that's the, the key to the future because there are kids at age three who have been waiting a year, I hate to say it, to have their teeth pulled. Kids at age seven or eight that have been waiting over a year to have their teeth pulled because they're no longer salvageable, but they can't even get in to get that done in a timely way. So we have a lot of work to do. That's why oral health was prominently in our state health improvement plan and will remain so. But it's, it's uh, evolving in the right direction, but it's a lot of work to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.